We have a very, very special service set up for you today, a special surprise. We've never done anything like this before, and uh, it's just, just my dad's had a lot of, lot of tricks up his sleeve, but this one's a little new one. We haven't done something like this before. I thought it was an original idea, but just like every other, I think, every other idea I think is original to me. God just told me myself, and I found out somebody else does it on YouTube or, or found something else out. And I was like, come on, God, I thought that was your and my little, little secret, you know. But he's got other sons and daughters that he tells things to. So I don't actually get discouraged by it anymore. I actually get encouraged because that means I've got the same father, and we're hearing the same voice, and he's speaking the same thing all across the land. Amen? So that's good. All right, so today you are actually on the set of a talk show, a talk show that I'm going to call Tell Us Your Story. Tell Us Your Story. So uh, that's what the couches are up. We didn't change uh, the platform. Yes, the beard might be gone, uh, but that pastor will return probably in late fall, and we're not changing anything else. I know we've done the chairs. Like, guys, this is too much. Like, please. So... um, uh, I warned a few of you before you came so you didn't uh, freak out too much by seeing me without the, the big manly beard. So uh, going, going back younger, that's the, my, young, my older brother that was doing that. So I'm the, I'm the young, the baby is back. Amen. All right, so are we online? We're good to go. Let's give our online campus a round of applause. Thank you for joining us today. Mike, I'll go ahead and switch this over. Now this is the first time you're going to witness something. I'll tell you, hey, 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 I have never used the lapel mic in my life. That's for pastors. So I just, I don't, I've never been comfortable with that. So I'm going to leave that mic on. Mike, see, Mike, run the mic. And uh, I was going to call you a sound guy because that just sounds weird. But uh, So both mics are going to be on. Everybody that's going to take part in the service today, just leave them on. Mike will mute the mic. Wow. Does Leah tell you to mute every once in a while, Mike? <laughs> Find that mute button. Amen. All right, so we're going to have some fun today, but uh, also we're going to get dive in, man, to what God is doing and has done, and that power is same here today, 2,000 years later. Uh, just to kind of give you a heads up what's going on today. Uh, again, this is, you are now on the set of a talk show called Tell Us Your Story, and if this goes good, we might have more episodes. If uh, not so good, this might be the only uh, premiere episode, so... <laughs> Uh, but I think I would like to do this with different Bible characters and hear firsthand eyewitness accounts of what happened. Amen. So we're going to hear that eyewitness accounts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. We're going to hear firsthand from six different interviews of what they saw, they heard, and even felt during that first Easter weekend some 2,000 years ago. All these accounts are taken from a book. A book that, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, is the world's best-selling book. It actually has the record. Come on. The B-I-B-L-E. The Bible. The Holy Bible. So that's the book we're referencing today. All accounts are taken from there. I want to give you just a couple facts about the Bible. In case uh, you're new to 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 this book, or uh, you just maybe never heard this before. Originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek containing 66 different books, penned by more than 40 people, but authored by one. This group of inspired writers were made up of all walks of life. There were kings, royalty, farmers, fishermen, tent makers, homeless prophets, a doctor, a professional scribe, and pastors. Hey, this is kind of cool not holding a microphone. Maybe, I don't know, it's like talking all, all about stuff. Any, hey, I'm on, I'm uh, All right. So spanning from three continents, think about this, written over a period of nearly 2,000 years, the Bible is the world's best-selling, most widely distributed book in all of history. The complete Bible has been translated into 704 different languages. That's more than any other book. The New Testament itself has been translated into an additional 1,551 languages. Portions of the Bible have been translated into another 1,160 other languages. Just for reference, I did a little search. How many languages are there? we got to be running out. There are over 7,000 known languages being spoken today on the planet. Yeah, we think we're cool because we learned English and Spanish or something. You know what I mean? Like, 
over 7,000. That's why Wycliffe is still in business. That's why people are still today translating at a faster speed than they ever thought of before because before they, like, computers and just technology is helping out so much. Seven billion copies of the Bible have been distributed worldwide. Seven billion. And in America, we like to have more than one. How many got more than one? They're still selling. A book that you buy, the same book you already have. How many, how many do that for another book? No, I've already got this book. I'm going to buy another copy, a different version, another copy. I want one at work, in my car, and now we got it on, in our app on our phone, and we can have it right there. And I've got 50 different versions in an app on my phone at the, just the click of a button. How many are thankful for the Bible today? Amen. Amen. All right. I've never been able to clap before when I thought I'm making my hand. This is so neat. All right, just to give you a little insight, as I said, we're going to have six interviews. And right before each guest comes up, uh, we'll have a passage read pertaining to who they are and the characters. I'm not going to tell you right now of who you're going to see or who's playing the roles. But as they come up, uh, uh, being a talk show, we want you to make them feel warm and welcome. And as each guest comes up to be interviewed, why don't you give them a round of applause as they come up. Amen? All right, we don't have any surprises in your seat. Nobody's getting a new car today, but uh, you can have a new life in Jesus. Amen? The car will break down, rust out, but that life's eternal. Hallelujah. That was on the spot. Amen. No one's already flowing. Amen. So uh, I think we got all the details covered. Are you ready to get started with our first premiere episode of Tell Us Your Story? Yeah. Woo! All right, we're going to open up. Hey, let's pray real quick before we, we start. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you for the freedom. We already feel, God, in your presence, God. I thank you for joy that is in this house, God, and it doesn't leave when we leave, God, but you are in us, and God, you go with us, Lord. I pray, God, we taste the victory, God, the power, God, Lord, the freedom and the forgiveness, Lord, that we have in you, God. Lord, I pray today, Lord, if there's anyone in this room or watching online that doesn't know you, God, Lord, that you introduce yourself to them today. Lord, bring freedom and healing, wholeness, God, that only you can bring. Bring your words of life that are like no other. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, our first reader, come up to the pulpit. Go ahead. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Amen. Well, we're talking about Malchus. We've got Malchus in the room today, the temple guard servant of the high priest. Would you give him a hand as he comes? Malchus, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Amen. Is it on? Are we, are we good? All right. So we just read a couple uh, verses. I know that there's more up on the screen. You can see all the text there. Uh, for all the guests, we'll have all the references. You can take a picture if you want. And I'd like you to kind of check those out this week and, and read up on the, the roles and the people we're talking about. But first off, we've got Malchus. So you were a temple guard. Uh, yes, servant of the high priest Caiaphas himself. Wow. Um, I had a lot of status yeah, and so responsibility. <laughs> we're talking uh, really in the, this passage that comes out about the arrest, the famous arrest, the thing that kind of yes. got all this started. Can you tell me about the, the group and the plan that you had that was put together? It was a hastily put together plan. Yeah. Caiaphas summoned me in the middle of the night and says, you're in charge of this lot. Uh, you're my representative. You go out there. You've got all my authority. So I've got a bunch of temple guards that were rubbing sleep out of their eyes, a few priests that didn't know what the, was going on, and a few uh, Roman soldiers that had been summoned to join the crew to kind of give a little bit of a authoritative mm -hmm. punch, and uh, every single one of them looking to me for some sort of guidance. And I had no clue what's going on. So it's, the verses, some of them talk about some weapons that were grabbed by... Absolutely. There's, what were they? Well, most of the uh, common folk, or some of the priests even, actually grabbed some wooden clubs. Wow. The soldiers had swords. Everybody was carrying a torch or two. It was a motley crew. 
Wow. But we were getting ready for some sort of uh, trouble, we thought. Well, they were ready for a fight. Yes. Wow. John 18.6 records something really odd that we read in, the, in this uh, news here. Something about all of you falling over, like uh, everybody trip yes. over the same thing. Like, what happened there? Uh, well, go back a little bit. We were assigned to, uh, or we had Judas assigned to us. Okay. He was betraying. He was master, one of Jesus' disciples. One of his disciples. And, uh, you know, in the dark at night, it's hard to make out who's who, especially in torchlight. All you see is silhouettes. So we get to the garden, pre-arranged signal. Judas was supposed to embrace the one he called master. So he stepped forward, and Jesus stopped him short and said, you betray me with a kiss? Wow. So seeing who it was, I stepped forward, and I said, or he spoke. Jesus spoke first. He said, who do you seek? Mm -hmm. I said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And when he said, I am, it was like a thunderclap. And every single one of us dropped. I don't even remember what happened. I just remember coming to a few minutes later, getting up shakily, looking around and seeing every single one of the soldiers, every single one of the temple guards, every single one of the priests. They had all fallen over as well. What Some of was them, that? We, we, it was the power of God is the only explanation I wow. can come up with. Wow. So you're pretty famous in this story for not just leading the group there, but uh, something that happened to you. Uh, yes. Other than getting uh, knocked out, and you got up, what happened? After we uh, got up to our feet, nobody was really doing anything at that point. Soldiers were still picking their weapons up off the ground shaking their heads, wondering what just happened. And Jesus spoke up again, almost reminding us of why we were there. And he said, who are you looking for? And this time I was a little more hesitant to reply. But I said, we are seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He said, that's me. Okay. You can let these other guys go. Okay. And in that moment, one of his followers tugged on his robe and said, Master, should we fight? Well... He had one particular follower that was a little more outgoing, I should say. Hey, Peter? Yes. <laughs> and uh, We know Peter. Yes, yes, very familiar. And uh, he didn't even wait for the master to reply. He just impetuously pulled a sword out from under his robe, concealed carry, <laughs> and took a swing at me. And he was going for my head. And I saw it, that glint of the sword reflected in the torchlight, and I just managed to move slightly hmm. out of the way, but not enough. And the next thing I know, I'm in stark pain, and for the second time that night, I'm on the ground. Wow. Sharp pain in the ear, yeah. So he cut your ear clean off. It, it was on the ground, man. I, I it see was, it's back now, so what yes. happened? <laughs> that was the most amazing thing of that night. I'm on the ground in pain. Nobody's doing anything. Everybody's silenced by Jesus' command for Peter to put the sword away. Again, it was like he was in charge of the whole night. We were there to take him, but hmm. he was in charge of us. And I'm laying there on the ground in pain, and I'm looking at this ear, this severed ear. You see, I'm a temple guard. I'm, I, I'm a servant of the high priest. Mm -hmm. I can't enter the temple maimed. Wow. So I'm looking at this ear. I'm maimed. I am injured. I, my livelihood is gone. Wow. My future is in peril. You know, you have those seconds where you're thinking these things over and over. Suddenly, I felt Jesus' hand on my head. And I looked up in his face and where he had been stern and commanding before. Suddenly, there was such a look of compassion. And he touched my ear. And all I can say is I was made whole. Wow. Wow. No, that's it. You guys can clap for that. That's good. Did uh, so? What What did he say after after he he healed you? And did he seem scared? He was not scared at all. No. He was not scared at all. He looked around at the crowd, and it was like he was chastening children as a father. And he said, "I am with you every day in the temple. If you guys wanted to hear me teach, that's where I'm at. You didn't mm -hmm. have to come out here at night like a bunch of criminals." Mm -hmm. Again, everyone just stood silently, not sure what to do. And then he spoke and said, but prophecy must be fulfilled. And it was like he gave us permission. 
and we finally stepped forward. The guards stepped forward and arrested him. All his disciples fled. And I was just left there in the dirt, wondering what had just happened. Yeah. And the crowd moved away, and I, I lingered for a minute, stood up and followed. And I, kept, I, I glanced mm. back, and there was that ear on the ground, but I touched my head, and I was whole. Amen. I was whole. Wow. I will never be the same man again. Amen. So uh, whose plan do you think was going into effect that night? It definitely was not our plan. Hmm. There was a greater plan at work. Is there anything else you want to share with us today before? One final note as a servant of the high priest. When I made my commitment to serve him, the Hebrew law states that my ear was supposed to be pierced through in the doorpost as a mark of my servanthood. And I looked at that ear and that mark of servanthood. I was no longer serving that master. Mm -hmm. I had a new master. Amen. Thanks for coming out today, Malchus. God bless you. All right. Our next reader, please come up. Okay, I had uh, John 18, 28 to 38, and it says, Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caliphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and, and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If you are not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law but we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill that Jesus said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back into the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is this your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? I am a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people, chief priests, handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no bias for a charge against him. Amen. Well, today we have with us Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the governor himself, and his wife. Would you come on up? Come on, let's welcome them to tell us your story. Please have a seat. Thank you. Well, I am Lady Pontius. <laughs> and uh, did you want to? And uh, I had a horrible week, I want to tell you. Well, I want to Be say, like, r before you get into too much, so in all the Gospels, you're really only recorded in one Gospel, mm -hmm. in one verse. But that verse talks about a dream. Now, it must have been some dream for it, it to make was. the Bible. All right, it so, was. so tell, us, tell us about it. Well, it was an awful dream, and my husband was, uh, came against by all of the people in the community. And they were all shouting at him and hollering at him. And uh, I told him that whatever's coming up don't have nothing to do with that man. Nothing. Because we had heard the testimonies in the last few months of what uh, this man has done. And it was all good. There was nothing bad in it. And mm. then after the week I had and the dream I had, I told him don't have anything to do with him. Mm. Listen to me this time, yeah. because as usual, husbands don't listen to wives, you know, and uh, a lot of times they listen to the peer pressure this and isn't uh, a marriage all uh, this stuff, show, so he don't listen, oh, okay. and uh, so of course I said my piece, and then I left it up to him, okay. but I knew he would take the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't mean to get you in trouble again, but uh, 
So, uh, it's been a long time. Mr. Pilot, Mr. Uh, Governor, it was your role, is that correct? Yes. What did you think of the charges that were brought against Jesus? I think it was a place that every leader has as a governor or judge that you're to know the truth. Mm -hmm. There's a, you have the sense of knowledge of truth. And um, I think that they, the, all these charges uh, and the anger of the Jewish priests was just jealousy and envy over this man. So you think that's why they were charging him? There yep. was actually no crime. They were just... No crime at all. I found him to be innocent. Envious and jealous of what? Oh, just of the, uh, the following that he had. The people were responding to him. Mm -hmm. Miracles that took place on their Sabbaths that they, oh, you can't have that. And yeah. It was just crazy. So another thing, you have a, actually a lot of verses, a lot of coverage. In, uh, you got some press in the Bible about your role that you played. But um, tell me about this Barabbas, and why would you release a known convicted murderer? In order to keep peace and to show compassion to the community, periodically I would release somebody to keep peace in the community. Hmm. And so for their feasts, I would rather than having this be part of the sacrifice, I would give them a prisoner back, that one, one that wasn't executed yet, of course. <laughs> you know, but so nice. I figured nice I'd take, take the worst guy. No one wanted. He was a murderer. He did yeah. insurrection, all kinds of stuff. And I said, this is the guy that no one wants. Thinking they won't choose They're him. They're not going to choose him. So I said, why don't we just, you, you can have Barabbas. This is my, my habit. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a substitute, so I'll trade Jesus for Barabbas. Because you wanted to give Jesus back. Yeah. There, I found no, no cause for death in his life. No reason to, to kill him. So that brings us to the next question. This uh, public display of washing your hands, is that something you do often? Like, what was that all about? I think it's a, I think it's a tradition that we get when we don't want to uh, have our hands bloody with somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, I'm going to wash my hands of this man's innocent blood. And then they said, well, let his blood be on us. Wow. You know, and I guess, you know, over history, we turn around, and it is his blood that, that changed people's lives. Wow. But I, I couldn't partake of that, even though it looks like I did a lot of participation, that was with a lot of regret. You really wanted no part of I it. I wanted no part of it. So you wanted to listen to your wife. Yeah. <laughs> but you could. Well, I... <laughs> but you, do you understand how the, the Jewish people are. Mm. They can be very rowdy and very religious, and they already stirred up all the people when I So there was a mob. Them. Oh, it was a mob. You know, 6 o'clock in the morning, there's a mob at my house. <laughs> That's not Everybody good. should be still in bed. I wanted to be in bed. So uh, John 19 records, all the other Gospels record about the sign that was put above the cross, yeah. a nameplate, a, a, a charge, if you will, but John 19, I think it's, this is very unique. He brings out that you were at the crucifixion and that you actually wrote the sign and fastened it to the cross. And then there was something about uh, an argument with the Jewish leaders. You can get into that. But, but what made you, was this common for you to go to every execution? What made you go and tell me about this sign and the argument? I think, first of all, I realized that this is an innocent man. Yeah. And the charges that they were putting against him were really false. And the things my wife told me and the things I experienced, the things we've heard over these last months, really said who he was. And even when his conversation with me. And so I didn't know mm -hmm. what they were going to write over his thing because mm -hmm. the other ones were thieves and, and different mm -hmm. things. So... I really felt in my conscience to write, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Wow. And they, and they didn't like that? that? <laughs> absolutely not. They said, they said, well, he said he was king. No, he is. I wrote what I wrote. Yeah. I'm the governor, and this is what I wrote. This is the sentence. That was your decree. That was my decree over that. Wow. Any, uh, any last thoughts that either of you would like to leave us with today? What's that? We can have regrets over situations that we do. 
but we can't live in those regrets. And somehow, God, the whole situation turned around for good. Hmm. Uh, I ended up losing my position over this whole thing in a couple of years. And it was a real tragedy. But in my conscience, I knew that I was right not judging him. There was even one spot where you, you sent, sent him to Herod, and I, you, didn't, you didn't like him. Like, you tried to get rid of this. Herod was a jerk. I mean, a, a, a Jew. I, but he, he was not a nice man. Uh, he had a great history in his family. And, but him and I did not get along. And, and uh, so I sent him to him because he was a Jew. Let him judge him. Wow. And all he wanted to do was see a miracle performed by Jesus, yeah. and Jesus wouldn't do anything. You know what's amazing? is that all these accusations, Jesus never answered a word to them. Never said a word to them. Never tried to answer anything. Yeah. You know, you can't answer somebody the truth when they never want to hear it. Hmm. It doesn't work. All right, well, I thank you guys for your time. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, Mom. Mrs. Pilot. All right, our next reader, please come up. Matthew 27, 32. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. All right, can we welcome Simon of Cyrene today? Woo! Come on, welcome to tell us your story. There's your microphone. Simon of Cyrene, so you are... No house music? You, no, no, no house music today. Uh, you are very famous, even though you've only got just a couple, uh, one verse in three of the, the Gospels, but everybody knows your name, who you are. Could you tell us... Uh, a little bit about, about yourself and uh, like where you're from and how far is that from Jerusalem? So Cyrene is not close to Jerusalem, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, it took a long time to get there. In fact, it's about 780-some miles. Wow. To put that into perspective, uh, that's about as far as if we were going to go from Erie to Charleston, South Carolina. Anyone ever been there? That's far. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, car was broken. Yeah. So caravan was down? We, we had to walk it, and it took about 32 days to get there. One way. One way. Wow. So what, what would make you take such a trip? Well, it's very important to do that. So it's my family from time to time, right? Being a Jewish uh, man living in Cyrene, which there was a lot of other Jews living in mm -hmm. that part of the, in part of the world. Um, but from time to time, it was a pilgrimage to go to Jerusalem and to do Passover there. And it was uh, very important. I had my two children with me, and... I don't know if you've ever been on a car ride with your kids, but try doing that for 32 days. <laughs> and uh, so we, we uh, the point was there is, is to there and to take part in Holy Week, or Holy Week, take part of the Passover uh, there in Jerusalem mm -hmm. at the uh, Holy City. And your two boys are even uh, named Alexander and... Alexander uh, and Rufus. Rufus. Correct. Very nice. Um, so what was the city like that day? Could you tell me a little bit oh, about it? Oh, it's like nothing I've ever seen. You know, I, we, we've done this before. We, obviously, we can't do that trip every year because we've got other things to attend to, but we, we try to do it from time to time. And this year, I've never seen so many people in Jerusalem at one time. It's a big city, mm -hmm. but there was so many people, and it was for the Passover, but there was anger. Usually, at the Passover, it's a time of reflection. It's a time of... Uh, celebration and, and looking mm -hmm. past them coming out of Egypt and, and those traditions that we hold dear and people prepared themselves a long time just for this to get clean to be worthy there's a lot of lists of obligations that we must conduct and everyone had done it and when we got there people were not pleasant and there was just a ruckus and then I saw a whole bunch of commotion and naturally I was curious mm -hmm. so me and my boys we went over to see what was going on wow so uh, and then you were, you were chosen to carry the cross of Christ. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. I was minding my own business. You didn't volunteer for this. I got pulled out by a Roman guard who, so the Roman guards were known 
to pick on anyone that wasn't Roman. Yeah. Anyone that didn't look like them, that wasn't their ethnicity, they would want to pick on us. And, you know, to be crucified was such a shameful punishment. Hmm. It's one thing to get executed after a crime, but if you were crucified, it was a shame that they wanted everyone to know who you are, who your family is, and that you are no good and to have association with someone like that is, is just awful. And so anytime there was a crucifixion, it brought some level of interest to see who is this person that did such an awful thing. So I, I was naturally interested. And he picked me out. You know, I, I definitely stood out being from Cyrene. Hmm. We were from Africa. The, okay. We look different than the people mm -hmm. over in the town of Jerusalem. So it was hard for me to hide, but we were kind of following behind the crowd, my boys and I. And, and, and the, the guard chose me, and I, I resisted at first. So I didn't want to be associated with him. Mm -mm. I didn't want to be embarrassed. I had my children with me. So I told my son to take care of the other one. After I tried to resist, and the guard threw me toward him and said, you had to carry his cross. I didn't know this man. He was covered in blood. I didn't want to be associated with some criminal. I didn't know what he did. He was probably a thief or a murderer or something awful that he was so beat up. You couldn't even recognize him with all the blood. And as I went to pick up the cross, it was laying on the ground. It was just so heavy. I could barely pick it up. It took all of my strength just to lift it up over my back. And then when I did, the blood that was already on the cross got on me. And then Jesus' arm wrapped around the other side, and we carried together. When he touched me, the blood that was dripping all over his arms got on me. And immediately I thought, oh, no, yeah. now I'm unclean. Because now I just drew, I just traveled for a month yeah. to take part in Passover, and, and now I'm now. unclean. To have blood on you, especially someone else's blood, was an unclean thing. There wasn't time to do all the rituals and the traditions and things that I had to do to be pure again. And I just thought, I can't believe they would do this to me. And now it would take a year before I could be made clean again to take part in Passover next year. And I'm not coming to Jerusalem next year. It wasn't, we weren't planning on that. Hmm. But as we started to move, I... He looked me right in the eyes, and I looked him in his, and at that moment, I saw love and passion and care, and I thought, this is not the criminal mm -hmm. I thought it was. It wasn't what I expected. Wow. And it wasn't, then I didn't know that the blood that made me unclean was the blood that would make me clean, that would redeem me, that I wouldn't have to do Passover anymore. Amen. And as we moved through the town, you know, I tried to carry what I could. It was heavy, but he carried most of it. Wow. I don't know how he did. He was so beaten, couldn't recognize his face. It's disgusting. I'll never forget that image. And as we got what seemed like an eternity across town to this place that they were known to, to hang people in this really gruesome way, I watched as they put this giant metal spike through his legs just to fasten his body to this wooden hunk of cross. Hmm. And because his ribs were clearly broken already, he couldn't breathe. Hmm. And he had to use the spike through his legs to push up on his body just to get a breath in him. And every breath was this labored push because his lungs had already collapsed from the beating he had taken. That'll stick with me forever. Wow. Is there anything else that you want to share with us today? Any other detail of carrying Our, my the cross? My life was changed that day. Life was changed. Life was changed that day. We took that back to Cyrene. It was mentioned later on in Romans uh, about my wife who hmm. became a Christian and my son but I became a missionary to Crete. Hmm. And we took it back to our people. We were there on the day of Pentecost. Wow. And uh, never again did we have to do Passover the way as the Jewish traditions told us we had to be clean because, you know, that cross, we didn't realize it. And it was, it was really at that time when I, I looked him in the eyes and I realized that this was the Messiah. Wow. This was the Son of God who had done no wrong. And this heavy cross that he was carrying wasn't his cross. What I was thinking about was my sin. Mm -hmm. The things that pulled me away that I had to do these Jewish traditions to become clean once more that I never had to do this again because I was the only one that was helping him carry his cross, but it was really my cross that he was carrying for me.
wow. and everyone else. Amen. And that's my story. Well, we thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Simon of Cyrene. All right, our next reader, please come forward. I have Matthew twenty seven fifty four. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, and they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Wow. All right, guys. Today we have the centurion at the cross. Welcome to tell us your story. Thank you. All right, your microphone's right there. All right, so a uh, centurion, that's different from other Roman soldiers. Tell me your role as a centurion. Right. I have uh, a list or a group of men that I am overseeing and in charge of and uh, carries great responsibility. So a uh, uh, hundred, hundred men. Easily. A hundred men that you oversee. And... Uh, so you weren't actually the one that nailed, you were, you were overseeing right, the whole process. Right. Just like every other overseeing mm -hmm. punishment. Um, it was a, a normal day for us. Just started it's out. bad to say. Yeah. But my soldiers, as I command them, they do what needs to be done. And sometimes they get a little carried away, but mm -hmm. it's part of the job. Yeah. After a while, it kind of get monotonous. Yeah. And they are known notoriously for picking on people that are non-Roman. Again, that is a downside. Mm -hmm. But in such a large community, we are the ruling force. Mm -hmm. So you oversaw many crucifixions. Right. What was different about this man that came? How did he come to you? Did he look different than the thieves? That yes, yes. He uh, was. In fact, there were three that day. Mm -hmm. There were two that were known uh, thieves, and one at was referred to as a religious fanatic. Hmm. Um, by far, not a right example. This Jesus. Right, right. They said he was the Messiah. Uh, he was very calm and strong in his word, even though he was beaten beyond recognition and already had suffered enough. So what was his demeanor? Uh, we read about some of the things that the thieves curses, and, and I'm sure they treated you guys bad. Uh, what was... Jesus like at the cross. Again, he was he was calm and and reserved, but yet on task. It's hard to explain. I've never experienced this. And all the crucifying punishments that I've seen in the past, this was definitely one that stood out. And the crowd both yeah, what were they were like? at awe and tor tormenting and many were yelling in in fear or crying out. Um, it made the the environment very tense because you didn't know what to expect. So it was different. It was very different. Some of the words that he said from the cross, how did those hit you? Normally when people are crucified, they can't really speak. Uh, as has been said earlier, their, their diaphragm is already ruptured or close to rupturing. But he still had this strong tone, hmm. like it was unreal. Uh, I do feel bad at one point he had asked for water and one of my soldiers tauntingly used a straw or a, a sponge mm -hmm. and a sword and dipped it in or a spear and dipped mm -hmm. it in vinegar which wasn't called for yeah it's recorded that he said uh he cried out father forgive them for they know not what they do do you think that was aimed at you a part of that i believe everybody who was standing there that was for he truly is the son of god and, and you're famous for that statement right there that you, you declared a man of authority. Did you recognize some authority that day? That day. In all my years of service, I definitely recognized authority that he was given. So do you still stand by your statement? Yes, I do. And has caused me to think more on my standings and my faith. So you believe he is the Son of God? I believe he truly is the Son of God. All right. Thank you so much. Bless. All right, our next reader, please come up.
And I have Luke 23, 50 through 53. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Ar Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. All right. Today on Tell Us Your Story, we have Joseph of Arimathea. Come on, make him feel welcome today as he comes. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you so much. All right, Joseph of uh, Arimathea, we know where you're from. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your relationship with uh, Jesus. Well, first off and most importantly, I'm a follower of Jesus. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm on, I sit on council with uh, the Jew, uh, Jewish council. Mm -hmm. I'm a respected member, and uh, I uh, own a, a tomb that uh, we place Jesus in. Uh, that I uh, had prepared for myself, actually. Uh, it was in a garden. So you had so, quite a bit of uh, influence as your position and a, a, a man in the community. You had quite a bit of influence. Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, but I had to watch how I followed Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so you weren't one of the 12 disciples or anything. Correct. Yeah. As, as Pilate said, you had to be careful how you, uh, you know, you had to watch yourself. So I was uh, discreetly a follower at that point, uh, up, to, up to the point where I, I went to pilot. So, we, yeah, when you came out that day, you put your, your life on the line, your reputation, you put everything out there. You made it very clear when other of his followers had abandoned, you stepped up. Well, I, I, I felt that, uh, I really felt that Jesus uh, deserved an honorable uh, burial and that... Uh, it was common in those days for crucifixion that uh, the bodies would just hang on the cross and it would be a, uh, uh, a pretty sad sight. But um, I wanted to make sure that uh, Jesus had an honorable burial and that uh, he would, uh, he would, we, would, we would place the body in, a, in an area that was uh, concealed and, and private. So by you doing this, by you touching, you became unclean. You could not partake. Correct. As Simon had described with the Passover, uh, at that point, I just, I knew what was right. And uh, I, um, you know, I, I just felt that uh, it was the right thing to do. You know, as uh, society sometimes goes towards uh, patterns of, of getting in uh, with uh, rhythm of, you know, doing certain things. And I, I just felt that uh, I was going to... Uh, uh, abide by that and, and, and do away with that and, and really just follow as I uh, felt led to do. So I don't think Pilate, the governor here, would have given uh, this body of this such well-known crucifixion, this, this, all everything that was going on, I don't think he would have given it just to anybody. So w how much did you just ask once? What did you have to do? And did you think I did. I actually, I was kind of surprised that Pilate allowed me to, yeah. uh, to remove his body. Um, uh, actually, Pilate had to have one of his soldiers uh, go and make sure that Jesus was was dead, was dead at that point. And then he came back, and then he allowed me to uh, to help him to to take Jesus down off the cross. Do you believe God put you in a place of influence, of wealth, of position in the community for this purpose? I do. I think He used me, and uh, um, you know we. We have to, uh, when we have, uh, in life, you have your resources that God blesses you with, and, you know, you have to uh, uh, really follow uh, what, uh, you know, sometimes it, it's in a different direction of what, what society goes. And uh, uh, to be uncomfortable 
you know, was I uncomfortable by going up to Pilate and asking him? I sure was. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, it was not, wouldn't be the common thing to do. Mm -hmm. So for me, it would have been easy to sit back and, and not, uh, not take that charge. But uh, I was, uh, uh, I was also thankful that uh, Nicodemus helped me. Mm -hmm. um, so we were able to take him off the cross and uh, uh, wrap him in linen and, uh, and, and get him a good burial. Anything else you'd like to tell us with me? You know, I would just say that, uh, you know, use your, your actions and your resources and, uh, and, and, and what you do uh, to follow Jesus. And uh, um, I would say that's it. Amen. Well, thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Yes, All right. Well, we've got one more interview today with our last reader. Please come forth. I have Matthew 62 through 66. Now the next day followed the day of preparation. The chief priests and the Pharisees come together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, least his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so, he, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto him, Yea, have a watch. Go your way, make sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre secure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Amen. All right, well, we have for you our final guest today, the guard at the tomb. One of the very own guards from the tomb today. Welcome to tell us your story, sir. Come on up. Appreciate it. All right, so one of the guards at the tomb. Why, why were guards assigned to the tomb of Jesus? I know we read a little bit, but could you, was this normal? Was this common? No, no not at all, actually. Um, but uh, the chief priests were concerned that during the night, uh, some of the disciples would come and steal the body and deceive everybody and say, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus has risen. Yeah. And people would believe that. Had you previously been assigned to guard a tomb or, or since? Uh, not at the time, no. No, no. Never? No. Nope. Can you tell me about the seal that was put? The Bible records a seal being put on the, the stone or the tomb. Yeah. So first the stone was actually set in an incline, so it actually couldn't be opened from the inside. Okay. Um, and it would take multiple disciples to actually move that. Yeah. And then the seal, we actually had a rope that went all the way around the stone. It was sealed with uh, big wax globs actually had Roman authority to it mm -hmm. so meaning if that seal was broken you know there was punishment mm -hmm. which to be more or less executed so we, wow we had a, so you were defending it with your life yeah absolutely you're making sure yes. it was sure yep um, so what happened uh, did you fall asleep did his followers overpower you like they said did they take the body so there was actually four of us there so the idea was two would be sleeping while two would be up watching at all times um, and even if we all did fall asleep there was no way that the disciples could have came and I mean it would take multiple to open that thing and it wouldn't have been quiet mm -hmm. so um, yeah just all of a sudden, like, you just felt the earth shake. And, I mean, this big, massive earthquake like I've never felt before. And uh, all of a sudden, it was just like this lightning and this shining, glowing, white as snow um, being all of a sudden just rolled that stone back and just sat on the stone. Really? And uh, we just immediately just, like, once we saw that, just kind of fainted. But we fainted, but we were actually, it was like we were paralyzed. Mm -hmm. I could actually kind of still see, feel, and hear, just couldn't really move. Did you hear anything else? Um, yeah, he actually, I, I did hear him say he is risen. Mm. Uh, so what happened when you told your superiors about this? So I actually, um, I actually went with another guard and, uh, or soldier, and when we had talked to the chief priests, 
Um, they actually devised a plan to, they paid us off to say that we fell asleep. The disciples came, stole the body while we were sleeping. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to take that deal. Mm -hmm. I know what I saw. Yeah. Um, and so I was actually against the deal. Uh, but uh, it was basically life or death to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if we didn't go along with that and chief priest didn't stick up for us, um, Governor Pilate would have executed us. So we took the deal. Did you hear what the centurion said at the cross? Do you remember what he's the son of God? Do you believe he is? A hundred percent. Yeah, I know what I saw. I know what I felt. Do you think Jesus is alive? Absolutely. Totally. Can we thank our guard from the tomb today? Do you have any? Um, Do you have anything else you want to share? No, I mean yes, like like you said, Jesus is alive. Amen. I'm a believer, hundred percent. Amen. Come on. Thank you. Can we give one more round of applause for all of our our scripture readers? Our Come on, that was not rehearsed. <laughs> we didn't plan that out for say uh, every word. Or I asked them to study the scripture and and kind of just talk how God leads them. And uh, we kind of came up with a few questions. But you just heard the story from the re from the arrest to the resurrection, from the arrest to the resurrection. And man, I, I'm I'm touched. I'm blessed by everything that we've seen, heard, and what they've even felt. So that is the sermon for today, and we're, we're going to go on just with a, a few other things. If you bring the, tell the nursery and the, the children's church to come back in, we're going to have communion. If you didn't get a, a, a communion cup, please uh, see the back ushers there, wave your hand, uh, somebody in the back, Josiah, looks like that's you. And uh, if uh, you need a communion cup, we're going to go on with a couple other things here, but take a moment. Are you watching us at home? Please take this time to gather some ingredients. Somebody said, I don't care if it's a Twinkie and chocolate milk. Um, it's the spiritual work that God is doing, but if you could, some bread and juice, a cracker, if you will. Before COVID, we used to break the giant loaf of Italian bread. Growing up in this church and mama being 100% Italian, I thought that was normal. And most churches don't make a big loaf of Italian bread and break it all up. That's just us. You know, it's like, you guys need to get on. Like, we, we want a big piece of communion, you know. And uh, we have the ingredients for you today. And we really encourage you to take part. If you don't know them, we ask that you... Call out to him before we take communion today. It's as simple as, Lord, remember me. It's a simple prayer that the thief on the cross prayed. I call him the good thief. Not so much that he was good at what he did, because he got caught, and he was paying a price for it. But while he was on that cross, in that position, he called out to the Lord. And the Father heard him. The Savior heard him and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. It's as simple as that. We don't need to make it harder than it is. Church, I thank God for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? Come on, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from my past. And the resurrection secures my future. We preach the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Come on, my past, my present, and my future. On the cross, my past is paid for. Your past is paid for. In the resurrection, my future is promised. And in the present, I can live with the hope of Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. My past, my present, my future. One preacher said it like this. I've got a pardoned past, a powerful present, and a promised future. Honey, if you want to join me up here and, and get, bring me a... I need some ingredients too. I didn't get any. I wrote a little note thinking about Easter Sunday. I know we're taking just a couple more minutes, but we're almost done. Um, thinking about Easter Sunday and, and the cross. We've preached many messages about the cross, and 
Recently, we drove to see our son in Louisiana. These things are a little difficult, aren't they? And uh, yeah, Jen said not recently enough. We'll be going soon again. But as you drive locally or across the country, you see crosses. Anybody ever notice that? You see crosses on the side of a highway. You see crosses up on a hill, on a high, top, a high hill top. And a lot of times, even locally around roads and bridges, we place crosses at a place of an accident where a death occurred. We don't place a cross there to mark death. We place a cross there to mark the one who conquered death. The one who brings hope in every situation. The one who brings uh, joy where there's mourning. The one who brings peace where there's chaos. Gladness where there's sadness. The one who brings beauty for our ashes. Is there a cross in your life? Is there a cross in the midst of chaos? Is there a cross in the midst of hurt? Is there a cross in the midst of pain? Because the one that's on that, that was on that cross conquered the pain, the hurt, the death, the rejection. He hung on it for you and for me. The power of the cross can be in your life today. The power of the resurrection. Come on, the power to live today. As one of our close friends said, the nasty now and now. The death, burial, and resurrection gives us peace that passes all understanding and there's never been a day before where we need that peace come on uh, positive thinking can only bring you so far you can't talk your way out of everything that's going on in the world right now i can't be positive enough to overcome all the news and everything else but the power of christ can cause you to overcome in the midst of it all hebrews 12 verse 1 through 2 god laid this verse on my heart this week Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, ensnares us, and run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this line is what popped out to me. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I want you to know today that each and every one of you, under the sound of my voice, in this room, watching online, are part of the joy that was set before him. I know there was a place of rest at a throne on high in heaven that he was going to be seated upon. And I know he could see that, but you know what else he could see? He could see your face. He could see my face. He could see your situation and circumstances. He could see the day that you called out to him. You are part of the joy that was set before him, that got him through the cross, that brought him through the resurrection, the joy that was set before him. You and I are part of that joy. So much so that every time a sinner repents, every time someone calls out to his name for salvation, all of heaven, the Bible says, rejoices because his joy overflows into all of heaven. You are part of his joy. His joy. For the joy that was set before him. When you call him Savior, he calls you Son. When you call him Father, you become part of his family. When you call him Lord, just like that thief on the cross, he'll bring you home. It's that easy. It's that easy. Don't believe the lie that it's any harder than that. It's that easy. The work of the cross is enough. The work of the resurrection is enough. Is enough. As we prepare to take communion today, you can... Communion is the believer's celebration of the Lord's Supper and His sacrifice on our behalf. It's the center of what we believe. His body broken. His blood shed on our behalf. It's a holy time to reflect, to repent, and to rejoice. So we take communion to remember what He has done. His blood shed to wash away. Not just cover, but to wash away His body broken so that we would be made whole. I wrote down this thought a friend of mine shared with me recently. I want to share with you. Taking communion is not just about remembering something that happened 2,000 years ago but it's actually bringing what was done then into today, into the present. And it's as real now as it was then. 
It pays for the price of sin just as it did 2,000 years ago. And as we take it, we're not just remembering, but we're actually activating that power again in our lives. Would you take and open up? And take the bread. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may eat. As you carefully open your juice, If you're able, if you can, if you would stand and we do this last part and go into a, a worship just for one moment. Verse 25 says, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You may drink. Let us worship. You didn't. 